Okay, Margaret, welcome to the No Woman Left Behind podcast. Thank you for being here today. Margaret, so for everybody that's out there, my name is Rosie Zielinskas. I have a podcast coming out that's going to be launching very soon called The No Woman Left Behind. And the podcast is dedicated to women in corporate. My mission is to eradicate the gender gap in the world, in the corporate world. And I am doing that by empowering women in their careers. And Margaret, thank you very much for being here today. I would like for you to introduce yourself if you don't mind. Great. So my name is Margaret Graziano, and I'm the founder and CEO of Keen Alignment. What our business does is we, our vision is to forever liberate the human spirit at work, which definitely includes women. And then we, our mission is we shape intentional, healthy, high performance organizational culture from the inside out. Awesome. So Margaret, I'm going to start right off the bat. Again, we're talking about women in empowerment in their careers. What would you say to a woman that is doing everything that they can, but their boss is not necessarily advocating for themselves? What are some of the things that these women can do? Well, um, the bottom line is have a conversation with the boss and ask what's the likelihood that you're going to approve this application for promotion. That's the bottom line. But even before that, there's all sorts of training and coaching. And it begins with, you know, what we do is the work we do is from the inside out. So it begins with self-esteem, self-belief, a vision for your life, values. And then the conversation with the self is, is this the right place for me? Is this the right boss for me? Do they see me as being capable and able to move forward? And then it's having a really straightforward conversation with that boss about the likelihood of there being a possibility for forward movement. Yes, I really like that. And so I know that a lot of people, like about 70% of people are not engaged in the work that they do, right? And yeah. so yes. from a management perspective, you have to have the right people in the right jobs. And so what would you say to a manager, you know, let's go the other way. What would you say to a manager that is doing everything that they can to engage their employees in their day-to-day, -day, but their employees are not quite getting there? Um, yeah, so, <laughs> well, it begins before their employees. It actually begins in the hiring process. Managers, especially right now, but it, it, I, before I had Keen Alignment, before I created Keen Alignment, I created a hiring software. Before I created the hiring software, I owned a recruiting company and was a recruiter for many, many years. And the, the engagement begins before you ever offer someone a job. And why are you interested in this position? And if the person is interested in the position because they need a job, that's the wrong person to bring into the organization for a job that requires engagement. So the key is before you ever bring them into the company, find out what their why is. What is their purpose? What fulfillment do they want to get out of being in the organization? And what's their why? And does their why attach to the company's why? And does it make sense? From that point forward, the manager's job is to enable that human being to accomplish their goals through that job. And that might not have been the way it was in the 80s or 90s or even 2000 or even 2010, but it's darn as well the way it is now. And every person needs to know that their manager is an advocate for them fulfilling their life purpose through their career. And that manager's job is to help remove obstacles. It's to help create vision. It's to coach and have that person see where they're in their own way or to get them training so they can move forward. But it, you know, how you get people engaged is you tap into their heart and their head about what they think is important and then they will be engaged. But if it's just a job, if it's a way to get a paycheck and a way to put food on the table, but it doesn't really inspire them, you can't manufacture engagement. And for many years, especially if the boss is an older Gen X or a baby boomer, or in many cases, a millennial who's just money motivated, not everybody's money motivated. 
Some people are purpose motivated. Some people are learning motivated. Some people are socially motivated. Everyone is different and everyone has different motivations. And it's the manager's job to turn on that light switch or to create the kind of environment where that light switch, where that light can shine bright. I love that you talked about the life purpose, because like you said, if you don't have the right people again in the right in the right company position, whatever, then it's just a job. So when it comes to the life purpose, let's talk a little bit more about the life purpose. Obviously we have, everybody knows probably about core values, right? So core values is the, the perfect example that I give is when someone is, is um, their core value is health, they're probably not going to go work for a tobacco company because their core values are not aligned. So let's talk more, a little bit more about their life purpose in conjunction with the job. How does that, how, do, how does that happen? So it's a great question. And I just want to be responsible and say, unless you have a coach and you and I have coaches, you might not even know that you can have a life purpose. It might be a blind spot hidden from your view. And you might also not even know that core values are for you, for you, not necessarily the company core values. So, you know, when I was a young woman, I was a recruiter. I was a straight commission recruiter and I was a damn good one. What my purpose was as a young woman was to support my son, David, who's now, you know, a 40 year old man. So feeding David, clothing David, putting David in a good school, being a decent mother to him. Honestly, I thought back then in my life, as long as I was providing <laughs> fun and food and shelter, that that was a good mom. And I've learned a lot more since then, but my purpose was David. And then as my kids, then I had two more kids and my purpose was them too. But as the kids started growing older, um, and then my purpose was my business and I, a I was confused about this thing called life purpose. Well, I went through a coaching program, a coaching school, and the first weekend was fulfillment. And they had us create our life purpose. And it took a meditation, like a deep meditation to sink into meeting my future self and how was my future self holding herself and living and what was her surroundings. And that's how I developed my life purpose. And then I took a program a transformational program in the human potential industry. And I, and I was like, yeah, I love this. I want to help empower people. So developing my life purpose was a journey and it didn't really happen until I was North of 36 years old on my 36th birthday, a month later, I was in the landmark forum looking at who I was and what's my life about in Chicago, by the way, where, mm -hmm. where you are. And that's when it began. And then it moved further through my coaches training institute. And so the purpose, when you tap into it, the heart feels it, the chest feels it, the head starts to tingle. You can see a whole new future that you couldn't see before you knew that you had that purpose. And so once you do the work and you can do lots of workshops, like we have one coming up, you can do that workshop where we do life purpose, or you can hire a coach to do life purpose, or you can read a book about life purpose. What color is your parachute is about purpose. So, so once you create the future that you want to live into, it's the essence of what that purpose is. So for me, I wanted to work with CEOs and help them fall in love with their company again, and even working for themselves. I wanted them to get back to that new beginning of how they felt in the startup stages, the jazz, the passion. And I created that at 36 years old and at 56 years old, I'm now doing it although I'm 57, but I've been doing it for the last 10 years, but it was a journey. And I always kept that purpose, that future self in front of me. And even in the choice to move to California and start the software company and then close the software company, even in those choices, it was always based on, am I on the right track or am I off track? Am I on track or am I off track? And if you don't have a life purpose, you won't know when you're off track. And so how it works in conjunction, let's say in these days, if you don't have a noble vision as a company, if you don't have a noble purpose, you're not going to get conscious, awake, 
motivated, hungry people to work for you because people want to make a difference. Let's just face it, a global pandemic will kind of do that to you. You'll stop and say, what is this all for? Do I just want to schlep documents all day or do I want to be making an impact in the world and making the world a better place? So you've got company A who has a noble purpose, like my company, to forever liberate the human spirit at work. Who wouldn't want to do that? Well, probably a lot of people, but a lot of people would. <laughs> And then you've got a person like Vivian who works with me and she says, I want to help empower women. I want my life to be about empowering other people to go live their full potential. So for me, she came here with little to no qualifications to do that. And we were just launching our Ignite Power program, but I knew her heart would be in it. And she has participated in so many Ignite Power modules and programs. I don't even have to coach Vivian on what to say or what to do or how to be. She shows up fully in, even, even on days when she doesn't necessarily feel confident, she leans into it because her heart's in that game. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I love everything that you said. And so I want to go back to a few things that, that you and I both have in common. So I also went to Landmark. Uh -huh. landmark education and I was I think about 37 when I went through landmark as well and for those of you that that don't know about landmark it's just a way to look at your life in a different perspective no matter what you're going through I was actually going through a really bad divorce at the time which is why I ended up going to landmark and I came out of it a brand new person not really worried about the outcome of, of the divorce because I knew it was going to be okay so I also live in Chicago and it, I do feel that once I was done with my divorce, I realized that, yes, I need to take care of my kids, but my heart was in my job and my heart was uh, there too. I was uh, doing a lot of training at the time and I wanted to be the best that I could be at my job. And so for me, my life purpose was then dual taking care of my little kids and also doing a really good job at work. So I found, I found myself and I found that excitement and that motivation within my, my job. But I do, one of the things that I recommend for people to do is to kind of go back to what is their why, like you said, because if you're not engaged in your work, then what happens? You're bored. Your days are really long. It's just not you a make fun mistakes. Place. You make a lot of mistakes and your quality of product is not as good. Exactly. And then also for employers, when you hire the right people and they're engaged, your productivity goes up too. So it's also good for the employers. But I, I do feel that everything that you said is right in line because Again, this is, you know, our audience is women in corporate and they may not even necessarily know that they're holding themselves back by not doing the things that you just said, by not understanding what their purpose is and so on and so forth. So, yeah, so a couple, a couple of things I want to say, if it's okay. Yeah, sure. So the purpose is tapping into your intuition, your highest level of wisdom. And so you might have to meditate to get there. You might have to go for a run or a walk on the beach or the lakefront or in the forest preserve or at, you know, on a mountain. But, but it's, it, it's not just so easy where you can close your eyes and say, what's my purpose, but it's really tapping in to that innate intelligence within and asking the self those questions. Who am I? What's my life about? When time stops for me, what am I doing? When am I in the zone? When do I stop worrying and start thriving? So I, so I wanna say that. Second of all, I wanna say that there is um, a litany of programs out there that can help people take time away from their everyday life to consider what's my life about. The Hoffman process is an excellent program. That's a seven day immersion program that helps you do that. Landmark Education, excellent program. Life Spring, which comes up in all sorts of different kind of names, or hire a coach who focuses on life purpose. And then the third thing I want to say is there's these seven levels of individual organization, individual team, and organizational effectiveness. The lowest level is hopelessness. This is when you have given up that you can 
make a contribution in your job. I'm talking about at work, not outside Mm -hmm. of work. You've just given up. You've just kind of thrown in the towel. Like I did when I, when I left the software company that was moving our product forward and kind of changed the meaning of the product and everything else. So above hopelessness is fear and anxiety. And this is where you are resisting what's coming at you. You're hiding out. You're worried. When you're in hopelessness, you are unhappy 95% of the time. And guess what? You're not productive. You're not effective. When you're in in fear and anxiety, you're unhappy 90% of the time. And when you're unhappy, you can't be productive. Also, your body is flooded with chemicals like like adrenaline and cortisol and norepinephrine racing through your body, through your chest, through your heart, through your stomach, through your digestive system, through your thinking brain. The next level up is frustration. And this is when you get to the point where you're mad as hell, you're not gonna take any more and you're gonna make a change. You're gonna draw a line in the cement and step over it and say, uh, this ain't working for me. And just don't have a conversation with your boss on that day. Breathe, <laughs> get calm. But that's your catalyst for change. Frustration is the lowest level of the ineffective levels, but it's the beginning. It's the mother of change because, you know, there's energy there. The good news is when you're in frustration, you're only unhappy 75% of the time. (laughs) So 25% of the time you're happy. But then when you step over the power and freedom line, then you're in courage and in courage, you see a whole new possibility for your life and you believe it. You actually see and feel and experience the possibility of a new future. You're happy in courage 65% of the time. And it's a, it's a state of mind. It's a mindset shift in engagement, which every company wants everybody in engagement. You're happy 79% of the time. You're leaning in. You feel like you're a real contributor. You're working towards a positive future. Then the next level up is innovation. This is where you're in creation mode. Rosie, it's where you are right now with this whole new business and this podcast. You're having a blast. It's a lot of work, but you're in creation. So you're using your highest level of intelligence and you see a wide, wide aperture and lots of opportunities. And when you are creating with someone like me or someone else who's also in creative mode, there's infinite intelligence available. And then the highest level, and by the way, innovation, happy 89% of the time. In synchronicity, there's happiness 100% of the time. Synchronicity is like Kumbaya, Dalai Lama, Om, and it's this feeling like I am one with the world. And everything that happens to me is a gift from the universe and a magical coincidence. And I'm not bitching or moaning or complaining. I'm looking at what I'm learning. And so the reason I bring these up is because many, many women, especially the bigger companies, feel they're stuck. And before you can actually make a move or ask for help from your boss, you must have a strong dose of self-awareness. You need to know why you're where you are, how you're where you are, the impact of being where you are, how long you've been there. And I'd interview people in your life. Hey, on these seven levels, how do I show up to you? One of my friends asked her husband, she, I, I was driving with her for a long period of time. And I said, I noticed you complain a lot. That's all I said. And I said it neutral and she didn't respond. But that night she asked her husband in a text, do you find that I complain a lot? And what do you think he said? You complain a lot. And so, but, but I'm a coach. So I just kind of spit it out there. I notice you're complaining a lot. (laughs) I probably should have said, are you okay? I notice you're complaining a lot, but Mm -hmm. I didn't. And I was kind and I was loving when I said it. So anyway, Rosie, stop. I'll stop talking. Well, I love that. I was actually, I'm so glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you about the seven levels. So I'm actually glad that you, that you went there. Now, what would you say to women that feel that they don't deserve to have the career of their dreams? Because obviously we know that women are, we're so hard on ourselves, right? We're perfectionists and, and all that, 
and all that stuff. But sometimes we don't even know that we're holding ourselves back. We don't even know that we're unhappy to your point, like your friend that's complaining a lot and then they didn't realize it. But I think in the underneath and the, you know, under the waters, under the iceberg, women actually may believe that they don't deserve that promotion or that they don't deserve the career of their dreams. What would you say about that? Yeah. So, so of course, I'm always a little contrary. First and foremost, I specialize in human potential. And I will tell you just as many men, just as many men don't think they deserve it either. There is a small percentage of people and many of them at least up until this point in the world are very ego driven, very economic driven. So that drive has them go for that job. But I coach executives for a living and 50% of them are men and they have the same stuff even when they're in the job. But we'll talk about women. So there's something called patterns. And by the time we're seven years old, our patterns are programmed in our computer. And one of a core pattern is I'm not worth it or I'm not worthy, or I'm feeble, or I'm not capable, or I'm not lovable, or I'm, I'm bad, or I'm broken, whatever it is. At Landmark, they call it, you know, your sentence at Hoffman, they call it patterns, but it's this way of thinking that happens from the point a human is born and maybe in the uteri, uterus, but before they're seven years old. So when I was little, and I was having David, my mother-in-law said, you have to read Dr. Spock. He knows everything about raising children. And she was a clinical psychiatrist. Well, leaving children cry in their crib to soothe themselves actually puts a shame wound in a child and an abandonment wound that no one's there for them. And they're a baby and they're screaming and they don't understand why this woman, why this person who was loving me and hugging me and now the baby's screaming. Well, guess what? I let all my kids cry it out. Now they'll all be in the Hoffman process saying, yeah, she let me cry it out and I've got an abandonment issue. But the point is by the time we're seven, it could be simple. It could be the second kid is born and the older kid says, what's wrong with me? Why wasn't I enough for you guys? And so once we have that groove in our brain, that neural pathway in our brain that I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, we don't even know we have it, by the way. That is right. invisible from our view. And then our perspective, our viewpoint, our, the way we listen, the way we talk is all on top of that, that shield of I'm not worthy. And so then we get a job, right? And our boss, I say, I, the, the employee says, I'm really bored. Like I said, when I was at my first recruiting job and one of the managers said, bored, you make more money than God, sit down, shut up and get on the phone. And I did. And I never, ever thought that that was wrong, that she said that to me. Eventually, maybe six months, eight months later, I got a different job because I was bored. I wanted more. I, I could place people with my hands behind my back. It was just a gift that I had. But, but let's go back to these patterns. So as we get, we have our first job and we have an experience with that boss. And if it's not a good experience, it validates that pattern. And even if we had a good experience, but then something bad happened, it validates. See, there's more evidence. Now we don't know we're saying this. And then we might develop a new behavior around that pattern. And then we might get further and further down the road and the groove, the neural pathway in our brain gets thicker and thicker and then another job and then another job. And so what winds up happening is these patterns run our life. They get in our way of making good decisions because I have a dream. I want to work with CEOs to help them fall in love with their companies and their lives. And then the pattern says, who the hell do you think you are? Who are you? You can't do that. Your father was a plumber or whatever it says, okay? And then if you're not determined and have fervor, you're going to listen to that voice and take the left road. I, it took me after I was in the Landmark Forum in the advanced course, and I saw my life in 20 years from now, which was living in Northern California, doing retreats. It took me a decade to take action on that possibility, a decade. So there was lots of patterns and lots of beliefs and lots of habituated thinking and habits, and then lots of conversations. 
but I fought the fight against it. I kept working towards that future. But I'll tell you this, Rosie, I would go left. I would go right. I would go left. I would go right. I'd always get back on the road, but I spent a lot of time over here in the ethers Uh or on the wrong path or with the wrong people. Or when I first made the announcement that I wanted to sell my recruiting company, all of my recruiting friends thought that I lost my mind, that I was having a midlife crisis. What's wrong with you? You do this program and suddenly you think recruiting isn't good enough for you. And I was like, no, that's not it. I want more. I wasn't running away from anything. I was running to something. So back to your original question, why do women second guess themselves, question their ability, hold themselves back? And I love the way you ask that question because the only person who can hold you back is you. It's your thoughts, your beliefs, your habits, your patterns. And so the key is you have to have a possibility big enough for your life, a vision, and not just, this is what I want to do for work, but where do I want to live? How do I want to live? Who do I want to live with? What's my life going to be like? Where do I want to go on vacation? How much money do I want to have? What's my future? You know, I had a, I had a guy that I was interested in and I said, what's your future for retirement? And he says, well, I think I'll collect social security. (laughs) And I was like, run for the (laughs) hills because I have so many goals and so many dreams. I don't want to be with somebody whose future is like collecting social security in this world. (laughs) So anyway, it's a very good parallel to people who see themselves no bigger than the box. And I was there every time I would think about my future, I would only think of a better version of recruiting or a better kind of recruiting company. I couldn't think of anything outside of this box. That was it. That's all I could see until one day I tapped in far enough and I could see a whole wide future. So it's a belief system. And you, and that's just where that self-awareness comes in. So many people, Rosie, will say, well, my boss won't promote me or my boss doesn't give me enough work or enough challenge or I can't talk to my boss. No, all that stuff is projecting. All that stuff is transference. You can talk to your boss. You have a mouth. And you could say, hey, I just want you to know I'm bored like I did. I didn't know any better. And she didn't like what I had to say. But eventually I said, bye-bye. And I went and brought all my talents and gifts to a competitor without even trying to. I just needed a job. But I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, it does answer my question. But I am going to go back a little bit and unpack something. So you said that you work with executive males and they have the same type of beliefs as far as that they're not good enough or, you know, they have their own uh, whatever roommate in their head talking to them. So and I'm sure that you're full aware of Hewlett Packard did a study of their staff like many, many years ago, and they found that men apply for jobs having 60% of skills, whereas women usually wait to apply for the same job till they have 100% of skills. So when we go back to your commentary about males have the same thoughts and the same uh, baggage, if you will, why then do they go ahead and apply for those jobs okay. and women wait? Okay, so this might not be the politically correct answer, but if you think about the evolution of the species, men were hunters. They were providers. Men must protect, provide, and procreate in order to be happy. That's Alison Armstrong's work. So they are wired, hardwired to be providers. Remember when I was mommy to David and I, you know, it was like being a straight commission recruiter or collecting, (laughs) collecting welfare actually at one point, because I wasn't getting child support. And of course I made the right choice because I had drive. And so it comes down to the fundamental drivers, men, more men are driven to earn high income than women are. So again, it could be programming. It could be hereditary, it could be epigenetics, but more men have their top motivation is economic return on investment. You know, whenever I hire people for my company, I want people who want an economic return on investment. And I've had some really great candidates, females who wanna change the world, but they don't have an economic, economic return on investment drive. So the concern is, will they do what they need to do to build a business? 
you know, it's that, <clears throat> that yeah. killer instinct and go back to the evolution. Men had to hunt to feed the family. Women were gatherers. They gathered the berries. They talked to the other women. They shared information. They, they were collegial and connected. And so a lot of women are driven without even know it's hidden. Again, another hidden from their view are driven to serve. So if you think about serving, I wouldn't want to apply to that job because I wouldn't be serving them because I'm not fully qualified. Where a man says, shit, man, I need that money. That's a great paycheck. I'm going to go get that job. And then I'm going to work in the evenings to get myself qualified. So I don't lose that job. I think, wow. and, 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 and we could say that I'm part male because I'm very driven for economic and political and theoretical. But here's what, what's interesting. Before I had David, I was in school to be an interior designer. The first day of the class, the professor says, so you think interior design is about being creative? Because I'm going to tell you one thing. If you want to succeed in interior design, you have to sell. You have to cold call. You have to build a business. I changed my major that day. So my motivation oh. changed when the child came into my life and I had to be a provider. Right. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I, uh, I relate, I can relate with that because when I was divorced and I had these two little kids to take care of, then I had to bust my, you know, behind so that I can start providing for them. So I can totally agree with that. So Margaret, how does all this translate into women to continue to advance in their careers, happy and fulfilled, and still have their family. So there's that work-life balance. Like how, how is it that we are expected to do it all? Yeah, so um, we're not gonna be able to do it all. We're gonna have to learn to delegate. And I'm not saying delegate the rearing of the children, but you can delegate the cooking of the meals and you can delegate the cleaning of the toilets and you can delegate laundry. We're gonna to have to pick the things that are high, low value and delegate them. Secondly, um, I do think we're gonna see a, a huge upswing in female entrepreneurialism. Like you see in the black community, the majority of businesses owned by African-Americans or black folks are entrepreneurial. And they, they know they have gotten the, the message that the only way to succeed and accelerate my life is to be the master of my own domain. And I think that's the same for women. And there are some companies that are super innovative and not just talking about inclusion and diversity and not just promoting women because the board said they had to, but really have this, this experience of, we are multi-gender organization and it just doesn't matter. Uh, so I think that women are gonna have to be proactive in finding those opportunities or creating those opportunities. And then I think that the vision for the life and the values will determine what you need to say no to and what you need to say yes to. And let's, let's also get that we don't need to be super women. She's a hero, she's not real. She's superwoman doesn't exist. And so, you know, we all have Alison Armstrong calls it the ideal woman. What would the ideal woman be doing? Well, the ideal woman would bring up the bacon, fry it up in a pan and never, ever let you forget you're a man. And she's hot as hell, right? I mean, we all remember that commercial, except probably if you're under the age of 30. <laughs> but the point is there was, there was a commercial on TV about like who you needed to be to be a successful woman. You had to be beautiful. You had to be, uh, have a great body. You had to earn a living. You had to be able to come home and make a homemade meal. And then you had to be the, the servant to your husband's sexual needs whenever he says now lady. And that's just <laughs> not real. It's just not real. And I think we need to give ourselves a break and we need to set really good boundaries around how much time we will spend at work. I honestly think the 40 hour work week is going away. I think there's gonna be way more people who say, I love the idea of 32 hours because I get to be in school and I get to have fun with my family. And you know, I'm gonna get so good at my job, I can command more money in less time. You know, It's like the four hour work week guy, but it's, it's becoming 
it's becoming more modern to go to the boss and say, I'll do this, this, and this, and this, and here's what I want to do it for. And I promise I'll deliver an X ROI. So it's more of a negotiation. So I think once you have your, your vision for your life and your values, and then you look at the areas of life that are important, like health and wellness, family, romance, uh, vacation, travel, fun, recreation, you know, all of it. And then you need to say, how much time am I going to spend in each of these categories? And what do I need to do for myself every day or every week? Maybe not in every category, but in parts of these categories, because honestly, most people are running on autopilot until 2020 when they had time to say, what the heck is going on with my life? And I don't want it to end if this is all I've accomplished. 2020 Absolutely. was a massive reawakening and a reset and a recalibration, which is why we're having so many people say goodbye to their traditional 40, 50, 60 hour work weeks. They're Absolutely. done. Yes. And I, I, I spend a lot of time with CEOs and it's a, you can see how impassioned I am. It is getting easier and easier to get them to listen to what their people need and what their women need. But I'll tell you what, five years ago, four years ago, 10 years ago, it, it, it was, it all landed on deaf ears, but now women are rising up and saying, bye-bye. Right. Now, I know that you had, you either ran a workshop or you were in a workshop where there was a problem posed to the participants and the men really weren't getting the solutions, whereas the women <laughs> were getting solutions. Could you talk a little bit about that story? Yes. So we were doing a, um, we call it a deep alignment. It's an A squared, alignment squared workshop. And we were working with this organization in middle America, in the heartland, and 90% men, I think there was two women in the room and we give, so part of this process is people look within, then they look at the, at the team. Then they look within what's my role on the team. What's my role in constraining this organization or being a pencil in the gears. <laughs> and then how's the team working together and how is the team, um, how is the team either entrenched in their culture or how are they emergent in their culture? And to the degree that it's entrenched, you've got a great strategy, but no execution because mm -hmm. the, the behavior of the, the people in the culture is the culture. The people in the human system is the culture and culture will either forward your strategy or, or um, collide your strategy or derail it. And so this company realized that they had an issue and they realized it had something to do with the culture. And I think that the general manager got enough feedback that he was a flaming jerk and he needed to get, he needed to fix himself or he wasn't gonna be there. So he happened to believe in what we were doing and he brought us there to work with the executive team. So they work on themselves. They say, what got me here is insufficient to get me there because if you've never done something, then you don't know who you need to be to do it. So it's the climbing or the moving through the gap that gets you where you want to be. So they got to inquire into who am I and what am I bringing good and bad to this team? And then who's our team and what are we doing that is causing entanglement or entrenchment? And so you go to the person, you go to the team, you go to the person, you go to the team, you go to the person, you go to the team. A lot of talking, a lot of inquiry, a lot of journaling, lots of exercises. One of the experience that we give them is an opportunity to work together as a team and do something extremely challenging. And the only way they'll be able to do it if they follow this recipe for what a high performance team does. So the majority of the companies, I might say, go right to execution without talking about strategy. They blow off the entire 20 minutes I give them on what it takes to be a team, like listening to each other, like having a plan, like looking at the big picture. They blow it off because many people, a lot of women and more men have something called the adrenaline bias. Remember when he's out hunting back as a cave dude and he's got these running and running and running and hunting. It's the adrenaline bias, as Patrick Lincioni coined it. So what the adrenaline bias is have us glom on to solve the damn problem immediately because we must produce. But we miss the picture. So that's all task mode. Let's get to it. Well, there's 10 people or seven people on the leadership team. And so these guys were going at it for, we gave them an hour. 
they asked for five extensions. And the general manager kept bringing me out into the hall. We're never going to be able to do this. This sucks. My team sucks. Why are you giving us such a hard project? Why couldn't you make it easier? Like after he pays us all this money to bring his team to the next level, he's whimpering and whining. Maybe that's part of the reason things weren't working. So <laughs> there's a woman in the room. She happens to be ready to give birth like any day. And she goes, I think we ought to do this. And she sees the whole thing. Now, one of the things about this woman is she has very high systems judgment. In other words, she can see the whole picture. She also has high empathy. She also has high task dimension. She's a hard worker. She grew up in the heartland on a farm. You're a hard worker. So she has this thing called balanced decision-making. She not only could see the task that they were building, she could see the big picture and the sheet, by the way, of what it takes to be a high performance team. And she could see and notice all the frustration and all the entanglement of her leadership team. And so I heard her say, you guys, what about this? And she was like talking the way I'm talking. And I said, hey, Mary, that's not her name, but what is it that you see that they don't see? Well, I think they should do this and this and this and this. I said, do you believe that you have the right answer? Yes. Why aren't you saying anything? She says, you don't know what it's like. I'm in so many meetings with these guys. And every time I say something, somebody says, this is what Mary meant to say, or this is what Mary means, or somebody will talk over me, interrupt me. And she says, they never listen to me. And I said, do you want to have a breakthrough in self-expression? She says, yes. I said, Mike, get over here, hold the chair. I'll hold the chair. We propped her up on the chair, pregnant belly and all. And she said, listen, you guys, I have the answer. And we've been jacking around with this for almost two hours. This is the exercise. This is what the strategy is. Let's do this, this, and this. They finished the project in 20 minutes. Wow. <laughs> she was, that woman's been promoted four times. I'm still in communication with her but she had to do an awful lot of internal work because she was raised as the polite, pretty girl on a farm that you do as you're told and you don't talk back. Yeah. Now, since that day with Mary, I've been to over a hundred companies and I can tell you every single executive team, someone's talking over the woman in the room to the point where I have called it out in a compassionate, bold way and haven't been asked to come back to the company. And those women that were talked over all left those companies, all of them. Wow. So we created a retreat, which we'll talk about in a bit, but we created that retreat out of a need that I saw for women's empowerment. And we even at that first company with Mary, Mary saw it all in that weekend. And then I worked with her for another 18 months and her team because we were doing an organizational cultural transformation from a 136 year old company to a new age, great place to work. It takes time. But she saw so much about herself and the other women and how they were submissive and waiting and asking for permission. And she, it didn't make her sick until the bag was pulled off her head and she saw her own weaknesses in all these other women. So she pitched not only her company, but the corporate office on, on a women's leadership program. You know what they said? We don't need to be part of this women's movement. Oh my gosh. So wow. we, we created, my team and I said, we've got to do something about this. And we had the females from all the clients that we work with help us create the curriculum. And now we have a robust program called Ignite Power. I guess I'm talking about it. Yes, go ahead. That's all about, having women access their innate intelligence, their intuitive side. So one of the things I was going to bring up about the um, how Mary got to see the solution. So men, and this is, this is documented, guys, if you're listening, men often, quite often, the reason they produce such great results is when they're hunting that antelope, they have single focus. The focus is to go provide. They're looking at what they need to do. Well, let's fast forward to the year 2022. Single focus will have you miss people. Single focus will have you miss the big picture. Single focus is have you focus on fixing problems rather than being strategic. But here's what women naturally have. 
They have diffuse awareness. Again, another Allison. Allison taught me a lot, which I didn't even know I was going to say on this, but she's showing up. So Allison Armstrong, <laughs> you're here in spirit. Women have diffuse awareness so they can come into the home, be on a company call, maybe a conference call where they're not doing anything, but they're listening. They can start making dinner. They can watch little Johnny that he needs to do his homework. And then they could see the baby crawling that's going to fall down the stairs. All of it. It's a natural, innate skill women have. They, more women than men have balanced decision-making, systems judgment. They can see the whole. They can see the work that has to get done and they can see the people. And it's a, it, what, it, what it is as far as neuroscience, the left hemisphere of the brain is about what's logical, what's practical. The right hemisphere of the brain, it's about what's intuitive, what's innate, what's creative. We all want integration between our right and our left hemisphere but if we lean too far left into the, what's the bottom line? What's the bottom line? What are we, what are we trying to fix? What are we trying to, and our left brain runs the show. We don't develop a muscle for whole systems thinking. Wow. It's so exciting because we can easily fix it. We can yeah. easily train ourselves, but that's the other. Uh, and I see it so often. And honestly, I, I don't want to bash the dudes because, you know, I'm single and I'm dating and I don't want anybody to think <laughs> that I don't like guys because I love men. Um, and the men don't mean to talk over the women. But if a woman sits there and doesn't stop the man, like our vice president stopped I have Trump from interrupting her. No, 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 no. Who interrupted her? Oh, the other guy, Pence. Yeah. That was one of the most profound things I've ever seen on national TV in my life. Yeah. Excuse me, Mr. Vice President, you interrupted me. She did so much for the brand of women yeah. in yes. that debate. I was so proud of her in that moment. So anyway, the women don't say anything. The woman doesn't say, <clears throat> excuse me, George. Thank you. I was, I was talking. They just let it be. And so we teach the men how to treat us. When we're in a relationship and the husband doesn't make dinner and he doesn't clean and we're working and maybe we're making more money than him and we come home and still do it all and we don't tell him, listen, honey, it's not working so well for me. In a nice way, we wind up divorced because it's, there's, a, there's a, um, a lack of reciprocity. I mean, it's one thing if you're staying home and that's your job, but if you're meeting and I've even dated men like that, like they have a business, I have a business, but they think I'm the, the cook and the chef and the cleaner and the entertainer. I'm like, eh, eh, I don't think this is going to work. So we have to find a way to communicate what we need. And I'll, I'll tell you the truth. It's even happened to me. My first large group cultural transformation program, I bought it. I brought in a 68 year old guy. And every time I spoke, he would go, what Mar Maji means to say is. And my colleagues were so offended. I didn't even know he was saying it. I didn't even know he was saying it. My colleagues were offended, offended. The women in the audience were offended. And my girlfriends were offended because they were in the audience. And they're like, you need to stop this guy. And he did not know he was doing it. It's like this ego that somebody turns on and they're there to protect us and provide for us. But you know, dude, I don't need that in the workplace. I got it. I can, I can do that job, but we need to be fair to the men because we can't just have dealt with this our whole life. And now suddenly we're going to throw them all out. And this is what's happening. We do not want to emasculate, emasculate our men. I'll tell you that much. They, they are, you know, Jesus Christ, whether you believe in him or not, he's a historical figure. When they put him on the cross and they crucified him, he said, Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. People don't know they're being jerks. It's just the way they have always been. It's their program, you know, the program that the seven-year-old started writing and then the 14-year-old coded a little further and then the 21-year-old coded a little further and nobody's called him out on this all these years. People cannot change overnight. We have to give them time. We have to be the advocates. 
for loving them and having compassion for them and saying, I know you probably don't know you're doing it, but you know, when you cut me off, I actually feel really pissed off and I don't want to feel pissed off at you anymore. So exactly. can we, can we have a truce? Yes. I loved everything that you said. And so when is your retreat? So our retreat is in Sonoma at the Sonoma Mission Inn on April 30th, April, th April 29th, 30th, and May 1st. And it is for female executives or women that are, have an ambition to be an executive. Fundamentally, it's also for female entrepreneurs and women who see that they want to have an influence in the world and they know that they need an edge to create that influence. They need an edge. This is about giving them the edge. This is not fixing anything. We're not doing deep therapy. We're working with healthy people who want to break through their career satisfaction, their fulfillment, their revenue, and want to create a life they love. And we're doing that April 29th, 30th, and May 1st at the Sonoma Mission Inn. And you can find it on our website. It's keenalignment.com forward slash ignite hyphen power, or you just put in hashtag ignite power. Awesome. Oh my gosh, Margaret, this was an incredible conversation. Obviously, everything that you said is in line with women that are trying to advance in their career. So I, I think this was fantastic. And by the way, I just wanted to make one additional comment that sometimes when I'm telling my husband about some kind of whatever, he's trying to solve it for me. And I'm like, I don't need you to solve it for me. Just listen. <laughs> so now sometimes he's like, well, do you want my feedback or do you just want me to listen? So, you know, we kind of have that a little bit you lined trained up. Him. You trained him. <laughs> he's a good man yes. and you trained him. <laughs> Absolutely. So, okay. So last thing, could you give me two actionable things that women can do in their career today? Okay. I'm going to give you examples from my own life two okay. actionable things. One, be very selective with who you surround yourself with. It's fine to help the underdog and to have friends who are needy, but if everybody in your life needs you to rescue them, you will not head higher than the highest person you're hanging out with. So it's fine to give back and contribute. Yes. Hell yes. I do it with Ignite Power. And we need to surround ourselves. We are the sum of the five people we spend the most time with. Energy is contagious. Attitude is contagious. Perspective is contagious. So you're hanging around a lot of party animals, probably not going to achieve your, your goals hanging around those people. Hanging around a lot of complainers who life sucks and they're victims, probably not going to achieve your goals. And the second thing is I personally spend a minimum of two weeks a year, 14 full days in training and about another 150 hours in training. And I'm not talking about reading books. I'm talking about spending time with Dr. Joe Dispenza or spending time in a landmark seminar or spending time at the Hoffman process or with my coach or, or learning um, neuro-linguistic programming or learning about neuroscience or traveling to a new country. This is one you can travel and learn and learning to speak the language of the country you're going to. If you spend a considerable amount of time in the growth zone, your brain, your neural pathways will become much more elastic, much more flexible, much easier to learn something new and change behaviors and open up your aperture. You cannot do it unless you put lube in the machine and the machine is static. It's like a computer program. It's not one of these emergent technologies. The brain is fixed unless you train it to be agile. And that's the beautiful part about being a human. We can reprogram our program, but we have to consciously know we're reprogramming it. If we just say, God, I wish I had a better job and I wish I had a great boyfriend and I wish uh, my life was easier. I wish I had uh, a servant. I wish it was like, you know, Jolo or JLo or whoever she is. And I could have <laughs> this and that. That's not going to happen. We have to say, this is the future I want. These are my values. 
And I'm going to go at learning and getting better and being better and being kinder and being more compassionate and, and learning to manifest my own dreams. That takes work. So two things, surround yourself with people who have a like mindset, who believe like you believe in the future that you want to create. Second, and that can be any way you can go find them or you can build the community anyway. And then, or you can help and try to get your friends to see life your way, but that might take a lot more time. Second, never stop learning and not just reading books, but engage in training, engage in new perspectives, engage in stretching your brain. Can I say uh, one last thing? Absolutely. Five keys to neuroplasticity, retraining the brain. That's almost the entire conversation we had today, yeah, probably yeah. because that's my field, human potential. Remember the vision is to forever liberate the human spirit at work. Five keys to neuroplasticity, eat well, and not from the old food pyramid, but from the Mediterranean food pyramid. Second, move your body. You know that song, shake your body, yeah. move it. I'm not talking about aerobics or karate, anything. Get the body moving, yoga, walking, running, biking, triking, you name it. The body is meant to be in motion. A body that stays in motion, stays in motion. We don't wanna be decrepit when we get old. Second or third, get enough sleep. I was just in, in a week long program called the Hoffman Process. Every single day, they said, how much sleep did you get? Why did they say that? Because they know you can't learn new things. You can't change your behavior if you're friggin' exhausted. Mm -hmm. Four, have fun. Go do novel, cool things that you've never done before. I had this um, coworker once in my life and she, Charlotte, and she would do every quarter, she would learn something new. And I said, why are you doing that? She said, because I never want to get stale. That was the first person I met that was living the growth mindset. And then last is practice focusing yourself. It could be mindfulness, but doesn't have to be. It could be meditation, but doesn't have to be. It could be needlepoint because in needlepoint, you must focus right in front of you. It could be art. It could be, but it can't be work, but it's training the brain to focus on one thing. Cognitive scattering is the biggest problem with being able to learn and grow. And it's turning into an epidemic. By the way, I have a book coming out and that book is called Grow Up. And it's all about transforming organizational culture from the inside out. But we talk about this multitasking addiction and cognitive scattering and it's, it's depletion of creativity. And so the training your brain to focus allows your brain to sort out. Remember how we said the men have monofocus. Well, a lot of women are scattered. Another word for diffuse awareness is scattered. Multitaskers, we have to learn to focus on the one thing we're working on and get it done. So five keys to neuroplasticity, mindfulness, mindfulness, novelty, sleep, exercise, and good nutrition. Wow. Uh, I was just going to say this entire uh, time that we've been together, we've been talking about the growth mindset. So it is, there is actually a book growth mindset by Carol Dweck. That is a fantastic book. So thank you so much, Margaret, for being here with us today. Everything that you said is, you know, take, take what serves you and apply it to your life because we talked a lot about life stuff, but apply it also to your job. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a corporate job. It could be any job, right. but everything that Margaret said is, you know, you can take at least one thing and apply it to your life. So thank you everybody for being here with us today. And remember to be brave, be bold and take action. Right on.